interpretation. She got a little, whenever I would say something that would kind of hit the mark, she'd get a little, briefly, a little smile would come on her face, and then she'd change the subject and go on to something else. And I would know that I had touched something that was important, which was very rare with her, because mostly we just had misunderstanding. But thinking about that later, I, I kind of made up in my mind, maybe this dream is a present she's giving me to help me understand what I've been doing to her, too. Because we, we basically were locked in a war of the worlds, where she's telling me I'm killing her, and I'm telling her she's making up science fiction. And I saw, I saw now, because of the psychiatrist and the, and the, uh, the, other, the other things that happened there, my telling her science fiction and all, that I was feeling very assaulted and invalidated and kind of fighting back on behalf of my own reality, which I needed to do because she was, she was overwhelming me. And it just became clear to me the nature, the war of the worlds that was taking place. She says, you're killing me. Maybe I am killing her, I said to myself, but I just haven't realized how it's happening exactly. But I'm not, but I'm telling her I'm not killing her. Maybe by telling her I'm not killing her, she's making up science fiction, I'm doubling up on the murder that I'm already conducting. It's like, uh, like what, if, some, if somebody's killing you, and you tell them you're killing you, and they say you're making up science fiction, but if they're shooting you, and her dream involved the experience of being shot, and the person who's shooting you, and the bullets are coming and penetrating and penetrating and penetrating, and then you say, stop doing that, uh, and they say, I'm not doing anything. The very, the very denial that you're doing anything is almost like you shoot them even faster and more and more, make it more bloody and more lethal than ever before. And, and the thought ran through my mind, there must be something I am doing without realizing it. I must be looking at her a certain way. I must be conveying to her that I don't understand her, that she confuses me. I must be making her feel she's a sick schizophrenic. I must be, I must be having a pathologizing attitude, or it must come across that way. Then I thought about, what is Anna's issue, really, and what's the theme of her life? It's really one, she, she's a person subject, like in the dream, to annihilation, to a complete wipeout of anything, but a shadow on the wall. That's, a, that's all that's left is just a faint silhouette of something indistinct. So maybe what Anna needs, I said to myself, is a different response, one that does not deny the destruction, one that more joins it, not joins into further destruction, that joins with the idea that, it, that something has been happening that is enormously destructive and is hurting her and killing her and taking away her feeling of anonymous, rendering her nothing but a shadow on the wall. And maybe that's, maybe that's her sensitivity, that's her vulnerability. And she's symbolizing the effect of the absence of that by this idea of rays coming in that are penetrating her. So I decided I would take a different tack with her. And I got real excited at this idea. And uh, this maybe was the next day after I heard the dream from her mother and realized that I too had been shooting bullets into her or sending rays or whatever, the, putting my nose, raping her brain, whatever the different... There, there, was a, there were other images she thought that ticks, ticks had gotten into her ears and were gnawing through her brain to the center. It was like multiple images of stuff like that. But all of them, I was thinking, the, what these are, are destructive, annihilating, intrusive invalidations coming from other people, including George E. Atwood IV. Okay. So the next time we sat down in the morning, putting myself back in this too, and it was morning, it was like 10.30 in the morning, and we're sitting outside the, the cottage where she spent her evenings and nights, whatever, on a little park bench, and I said to her, uh, she, was, she was starting again about the rays or something, I said, shut up for a minute, I've got something so important to say to you, it's unbelievable. And I put my finger on her lips to shut her up, like I did with the... Uh, Hit me, hit me too, the day, the day we did that. Just let me, let me say that. Let me just say my thing. So she was quiet. And you, you're not going to believe this. You're just not going to believe it. You have to live through these things to see if such a thing would be possible. There's something that I haven't understood that I do understand now, Anna. I have been hurting you really, really, really badly. The hurt has been so, so terrible. I haven't seen it. I didn't understand it. I do see it now. I do understand it. I need you to know something. I never meant to hurt you. Never, never, never. I hope and I pray that you and I can find a way to undo the damage that has occurred. But in the meantime, in the meantime, 
No, but I didn't see it, but I do now. I have hurt you so badly. That, that's all I said, just like that, in, in about that length of time. You know, talking for 30 seconds at the most. <coughs> she looked up at me, quiet for five, ten seconds maybe. She said, would you be interested in going and get some coffee and donuts? <laughs> I said, As a matter of fact, I would. And we got up, went to the hospital canteen, loaded up on six ugly, big, uh, frosted donuts and big coffees with all kind of sugar in them and half and half, wrecking our arteries, <laughs> and drank it and ate it. And the whole delusion, poof, it was gone. It just wasn't even there anymore. And I'm 30, 33 years down the, down the road from that too. Now, it hasn't come back in 33 years either. It's just gone without a trace. It's just gone. And all it was, all I really did was own the responsibility for, I didn't even use the word raise or blocks or anything like that. I just thought those, those are the metaphorical symbols that she's using. I don't even have to use those particular images. But I do have to talk about hurting her and that being really, really bad. And if I deny it, I make it worse. And that's what had been happening the whole time. This is the part that's hard to believe. You go, you go through these struggles with people and they just drive you crazy and you drive them crazy and you're both sweating and bloody and it's hard, exhausted, and you wonder, why did I ever go in this profession? And you feel the patient's driving you out, and the patient feels you're destroying them, worse than anybody ever destroyed them. And then a moment comes, and if there's understanding, sometimes, often, the, it's like the sun comes out, the clouds <coughs> lift, the storm ends, and she was so much better after that. And the, the, the entire structure of paranoia just vanished without any trace at all. And all it seemed to be, seemed to be required was for me to grasp that she really was feeling intruded upon, annihilated, wiped out, in just the way she'd been describing it. Her, her imagery and her language was pretty colorful, rays and blocks and walls and all that. I was able then to understand what the whole thing about birth was. It, it's, it's like being born, being born, it, it wasn't complicated. It means like um, being ushered into an experience of existing continuously, being psychologically born, psychologically, phenomenologically, experientially, coming into being as an enduring experience, as opposed to being blocked from that, which she symbolized with all this idea of the brain and everything like that, but it, was, it, has, it had to do with uh, her achieving a continuous, substantial sense of her own personal identity. That's basically it. And uh, what, what an experience that was. It taught me so much. And, the, the, the role of the concept of validation in particular, and invalidation, in the psychotherapy of people who are uh, designated schizophrenic is so important and central, it's scarcely seen at all in contemporary psychiatry, because they believe in the medical model. But how many times have I had, the, have had such experience where, actually the story I'm telling you has, an, it's, 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 it has a lot of commonality with the story I left off from last time. I told you last time about my colleague in New York, who had the patient, had persecutors throwing keys and pumping gas in and <laughs> killing her and all of that. And there too, the therapist saw that something she had done was feeding into the paranoia and invalidating the patient. The patient was symbolizing the annihilation that was, under, that was uh, she was undergoing in this extravagant delusional system. But once she saw that, she was able to address it, apologize for it, recognize the harm that she had done, and that too just lifted without a trace. With Anna, it was even more dramatic because she had been struggling with this delusion for all this, for years. And the thing is, was just gone. Were, were the great struggles with her over? No, they were not over. They continued. And uh, I don't have time to tell you the next one, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold up until we'll stop now. But we'll, next time, we'll, I'll tell you the next adventure with her.